Welcome to this episode of Litigation Briefs, Media Shorts on Law and Courts. I'm Scott Dodson, a distinguished professor of law at UC Hastings College of the Law and the director of the Center for Litigation Courts, which produces this series. We all know that litigation depends upon the facts and the law. If you hit someone with your car because you weren't paying attention, the law says you'll likely be liable for negligence. And how much you will have to pay in damages will depend upon the facts that establish the other person's injuries. So the substance of the case, the facts and the law that govern the claim and any legal defenses are undoubtedly important. But in 1983, a congressman named John Dingell said on the House floor, I'll let you write the substance and you let me write the procedure and I'll screw you every time. Procedure, it turns out, is important too. People with slam dunk cases on the law and facts can lose a case if they don't follow the procedural rules of court. So what is court procedure? How are the procedural rules made and why are they important? Here to help me with these questions is my guest, Ben Spencer, Dean and Chancellor Professor of Law at William & Mary Law School. He also serves as a member of the Civil Rules Advisory Committee. Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start with an example of court procedure. Choose a rule and tell me about it. Well, I thought a pretty simple rule to tell folks about would be rule four. And that's just a rule that governs the way that you have to give notice of a lawsuit. So clearly, if someone is being sued, that's something they need to know. They need to have notice of that. And Rule four provides for service of process, and it just tells the plaintiff what they have to prepare and serve or deliver to or serve on the defendant in a case so that they know about it and can respond. And that's not the only rule, of course. In general, what else do the rules cover? The, the rules are pretty comprehensive. Uh, you start out, as I mentioned, with how a case is initiated with service of process. Then there are rules that govern the documents that are called pleadings. And this is just the documents in which the plaintiff will state their case. That's called a complaint. Then when the defendant responds, that's in an answer. And so there's a little bit of back and forth that happens there. That's covered by the rules. There's also things called motions where you might make an argument to the court that the court should dismiss the case. And that would be called a motion to dismiss. And there are other types of motions. Those are covered in Rule 12 and, and other rules. Then there's rules that govern how the case is shaped. Maybe there are multiple plaintiffs who want to sue together or a plaintiff wants to sue multiple defendants and that's called joinder. So there's a series of rules that govern the joinder of parties and, and claims in an action. Then moving on through the process, you have the discovery process, which people may have heard of. Uh, and that's where there's information exchange between the parties. And that's covered by a series of rules uh, in the procedural rules as well. And it goes on till you get to the end of the trial. There are motions that can take place after the trial is over. Uh, and then there are things that govern the right to a jury and how you see the jury, how many people need to be on there. So everything that, that governs the trial process in the district courts from start to finish. Does each court have its own rules? Well, in the federal system, there's a comprehensive set of rules called the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, and that governs the procedure in all of the federal district courts. Those are the trial courts. There are also rules for the federal appeals court called the Federal Rules of Appellate Procedure. Then the United States Supreme Court, it has its own rules. And then if you go to the different states, each state has rules that govern the judicial process in their respective judicial systems. Many of those rules are similar to those you'll find in the federal system, and some states have their own set of rules that vary in, in different ways. And what happens if you break a rule? Well, there can be a, a couple of things. You know, sometimes if you don't comply with the rule, let's say a, a pleading rule, the court might give you another chance. So in, instead of just throwing you out of court with, with no hope for redemption, redemption you can try again and try to write the pleadings in compliance with the rule. Or perhaps if you don't serve somebody properly, 
that would be an opportunity for that defendant to respond by saying, well, I want to have the case dismissed or I want to quash the subpoena. So sometimes you can try again. Sometimes if you don't comply with the rule, that might be grounds for a challenge, such as a dismissal, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, sometimes if you don't comply with rules like the discovery rules, that can result in sanctions. Uh, and that's a, a type of discipline that can vary in, in different ways. Uh, so there's a variety of, of responses to the violation of rules, depending upon the circumstances. So the rules are pretty important, and I guess that raises the question of who makes them and how are they made? So can you answer those questions? Absolutely. So it's a, it's a process that is, is public, but not very well known. Uh, so the rules that I mentioned earlier, you have the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and the Federal Rules of Appellate Procedure. For each of those rules, there's a group called a advisory committee. So for the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, we have the Civil Rules Advisory Committee, of which I am a member. And we look at the rules and receive proposals for rule changes. And we circulate those for comment from the public. So there's an opportunity to get feedback. Uh, we can hear testimony. And then once we've decided that there's an amendment to one of the rules that we want to propose, we send that to something called the Standing Committee, which is a committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States. And that committee consists mainly of judges, but other people appointed by the Chief Justice. That Standing Committee will take a look at it. And if they like the proposal, then they'll send it to the next level, which is the Judicial Conference, which consists of the Chief Judges of the Circuits and a designee District Court Judge from each of the circuits. And it's chaired by the Chief Justice of the United States. If the Judicial Conference approves the amendment, then it goes to the US Supreme Court. And they typically have until about May 1st of the year uh, after they've received it to weigh in on whether they're going to approve it. If the Supreme Court approves it, then it goes to Congress, typically by that May 1st deadline. And then Congress has until December 1st to enact legislation rejecting those changes. So if Congress does nothing, then by December 1st, following the Supreme Court's approval of those proposals, the rules take effect. So it's a bit of a convoluted process, um, but it's very thorough and deliberative and, and ensures that we get some good results at the end. Do, does the complication and convolutedness of the rulemaking process mean that some rules never get adopted? Absolutely. Uh, there are many proposals that come through the system and vastly more proposals than you see get enacted. Uh, some of the proposals may be for minor technical changes. Some may be for sweeping changes uh, that might overhaul a particular aspect of the system. And the changes typically don't make it through unless there's a pretty clear imperative that change or reform of some type is needed. So you'd have to say, well, this rule isn't really working particularly well, or perhaps it's creating some major inefficiencies, or it's too burdensome for one side or the other, or maybe the rule is leading to lopsided outcomes that favors plaintiffs versus defendants. Uh, but there'd have to be some sort of imperative that motivates the committee to take this up. And the other thing is, you know, the committee is only so large. I think there are about 13 or 14 voting members. So it really only has so much bandwidth uh, to consider a handful of proposed changes at a given time. So it does take some time for things to work through the system. But that said, it's a very open process. Anybody, any member of the public can submit a proposed suggestion for changing one of the rules. And the committee will put that on its agenda uh, and it will be something that will be considered uh, and it may go forward if there's some merit to it. And so what's, what's all this really for? What's so important about having a set of rules like this? Well, what I've ex explained to people is, is that it's like election law. I think right now, everyone who has been paying attention has by now seen how important the rules governing elections are. It depends on how the election laws are written and that can really affect who gets to vote and ultimately it has a major impact on the outcome of an election. And it's the same with judicial procedure. 
the way that the rules of court and the rules of judicial procedure are written can have an impact on the outcome of a case, who wins and loses and why. So it's really important to pay attention to these rules. They're not just technicalities uh, that we can be, you know, cast, that can be cast to the side, uh, but they can really significantly outcome, uh, in, impact the outcome of a case. So uh, they're very important to pay attention to. Ben, thanks so much for being on the show and for helping us understand why court rules are important. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. This episode was produced by the Center for Litigation and Courts at UC Hastings College of the Law. If you enjoyed this episode of Litigation Briefs, I hope you'll tune into future episodes. In fact, I hope you'll consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and audio podcast, which can be accessed through the Center for Litigation and Courts website at sites.uchastings.edu slash CLC. While you're at it, encourage a friend to do the same. This is Litigation Briefs, respectfully submitted, Scott Dodson. <laughs>